morning, everyone. I'm going to do something this morning I've never done before. I'm going to use a PowerPoint. <laughs> They're going to be my guinea pigs. Lord have mercy. So let's see how this is going to go. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege to come into your courts this morning to praise you, to return our thanks, to hear the story of your birth and your mission and your accomplishment. Uh, and even still now, what you're doing for us. We're grateful also and mostly for the chance to come and worship. We invite your presence again. We pray that our hearts and our minds are open to receive the truth that you have for us today. May our heart burn with hold from your heavenly altar, and uh, I pray that my lips will be touched this morning as I bring this message. Thank you for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> so our title today, I wanted to give it a real old-fashioned 1800s title. I'm trying to get as many words in there as possible. The nature of the Godhead, Trinity or Triunity. If you've never heard the term triunity before, but we're going to talk about it a little bit today. One of the most important scenes in all of the Bible, one that has impacted the history of the world, is found in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus had been raised from the dead after his crucifixion, just as he told his followers what happened. Though at first they doubted the stories of his resurrection, when he finally appeared to them in person, their faith in him as the Messiah was affirmed, and they were ready to do his will matter where it might take them. So at the end of Matthew's gospel, when the risen Lord is with his followers, he give them, gives them what is commonly known as the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is a very familiar passage. We've heard it many times. We've read it many times. The question before us today is, do these verses, verses teach us anything about the Godhead? According to this text, the disciples, the leaders of the early church, were to go to the whole world and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Converts were not to be baptized in the name of the Son only, or of the Father only, nor in the name of the Holy Spirit only. No, they were to be baptized in the name of all three. The Greek word for name here appears in the singular, meaning that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were listed under a singular name. If nothing else, this text shows the close relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But a lot of questions arise and have been asked for centuries. Is God the Father the only one God, or is the Son God as well? If they are both God, does that mean that Christians worship more than one God? Is the Father superior to the Son? Did the Son come into existence after the Father? Was there a time when the Father existed, but the Son didn't? And what about the Holy Spirit? How does he fit into all of this? Is he God too? If he is, does that mean that Christians now worship three gods? Just what or who is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit divine? Or just an impersonal force or energy emanating from the Father or the Son? From the early days of the Christian church, the subject of the nature of the Godhead has caused contention among the faithful. Keep in mind as we move along in this study today, the most basic fact about the nature of God. We are finite, and as such, we should approach this topic with utmost humility. If we recognize that we'll be studying the nature of God and the plan of salvation throughout eternity, then we shouldn't be so surprised if some things about him remain hard for us to comprehend. That realm. The flip side of that should also be true. Even if we may not be able to comprehend all aspects of this topic, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to understand the scriptural teaching regarding it. Amen? The Bible has given us very clear information on the nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which I believe we can take as sufficient evidence that God wants us to understand to the degree that finite minds can even understand what he has revealed to us in his word. Otherwise, why put that information in the Bible? 
let's consider the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Godhead. The official statement of our beliefs, fundamental belief number two, states the following. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. God is one in essence, in mind, in aim, in goal, in purpose, in character, yet three in person. But how can three persons each be fully God, yet there be just one God? To this day, religious Jews often recite a line called the Shema from the Old Testament. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohanu Adonai Echad. You didn't know I could speak Hebrew, did you? In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the literal reading is the one is more than one, yet is one. The Old Testament is repeatedly very clear about one thing. Only one God, Yahweh, the Lord of the Hebrews, is real. All other gods that the pagan nations around Israel worship are false or non-existent. When we read Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That word one, Echad in Hebrew, can refer to multiple. You will find an example of that in Exodus 24.3. And Moses, okay, so all my hidden slides are showing up now. All right, so this is going to be real fun. You weren't supposed to see that slide. All right, Exodus 24, 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. Notice the people answered with one voice. Yet how many hundreds of thousands responded? Here, one represents unity, a composite of beings functioning as one. There are several examples in scripture of the plurality of God. So let's begin at the very beginning with Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So why does one God refer to himself in plural form? Consider this analogy. One water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. There are three distinct parts, and yet still, how many water molecules is it? One. Despite the three distinct parts, it is still just one water molecule. Couldn't the same be said of one God made of three distinct beings? This idea of the plurality of God is also seen in here in Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Is God both singular and plural? Yes. Is he one God and yet possessing more than one individual part? Yes. Is this evident only in the Old Testament, or does the New Testament support this teaching? Let's consider. Now, Scripture is abundantly clear that God is the creator, right? All that has come into existence came from him. Colossians chapter 1 tells us, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things exist. But what about the time before he created the world? What about the time when all that existed was God alone, before he had created anything else, either in heaven or in earth, even angels? First John 4, eight tells us that God is, God is love. So if God was loved before he had created anyone or anything, whom did he love? If nothing and no one was there, what or who existed for God to love? It takes at least two to love, one to love and one to be loved. 
Therefore, there had to be at least two members of the Godhead from the very beginning, right? In fact, I would argue that the minimum number of individuals needed in order to express perfect agape love is three. More on this later. And in the New Testament, the reality of God's plural nature becomes quite apparent. One of the most powerful scenes in the New Testament is the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Right there at the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead, are manifest. In John chapter 10, Jesus claims equality with the Father. I and my Father are one. In Acts chapter 5, the Holy Spirit is identified with God himself. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? That was not lied unto men, but unto God. If we lie to the Holy Ghost, we're lying to God. Isn't that right? That's what the text says. And Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3 parallels the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, name of the Holy Ghost. All three members of the Godhead listed individually, singularly, but all under the name of God. Ask yourself this question. Why would the Son and the Holy Spirit, if somehow unequal with the Father, be placed on the same level with the Father when it comes to something as important as teaching and baptizing? It would be blasphemous to equate lower or inferior beings to the Father. However, between the mutual appearance of the Father, Son, and Spirit at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and their being named together again at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we have been prov provided significant evidence for the idea of a triune Godhead, a Godhead composed of three equal but distinct thinking sentient beings. By letting Scripture interpret Scripture, by using Bible texts to explain other Bible texts, a student of the Scriptures will find abund abundant evidence the New Testament for a Godhead composed of more than one distinct and individual being. Consider these verses. John 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Who's speaking here? Christ. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. After the Son returned to the Father, both the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit into the world. Therefore, the Holy Spirit must be distinct from the Father and the Son. That's pretty basic, isn't it? Look for the entire Godhead mentioned in the following verses, John 14. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. How many members of the Godhead are listed in that verse? All three. Romans 15. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Who does the sanctifying in this verse? The Holy Ghost. But isn't sanctification the function of God? According to 1 Thessalonians 5, it is, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Also consider 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. If God sanctifies and the Holy Spirit sanctifies, then the Holy Spirit is obviously God, right? Clearly. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the 
the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Again, all three heavenly persons linked together. Amen? Even the opening chapter of the book of Revelation came, contains reference to the three persons of the Godhead. John to the seven churches which, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. In discussions about the nature of the Godhead, no one really questions the deity of the Father. Christians, Muslims, and Jews all agree that the Father is God. The problems arise when the deity and eternity of Jesus Christ, or particularly the Holy Spirit, are discussed. Where else to start other than John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The phrase in the beginning points us directly back to Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For what John wrote to be true, Jesus could not have been made because he himself created all that was made. How could that have included himself? You can't create yourself because you would already have to exist in order to do it. The logic alone of these texts makes the idea of Jesus as a created being impossible, even absurd. As with Jesus, the deity of the Holy Spirit has been questioned, challenged, and denied throughout history. Arius in the fourth century rejected the full deity of the Holy Spirit. Through the centuries, various others have done the same thing. Today, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses in Islam and Judaism all deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, Protestant Christianity confirms that the Holy Spirit is God. And while the biblical evidence for the divinity of the Holy Spirit is more subtle than the evidence for the divinity of Christ, there are still many powerful passages that support it. In seeking to understand the deity of the Holy Spirit, we run into a question that we do not run into when it comes to Jesus. Namely, what is the personhood of the Holy Spirit? Yes, we can understand the Father as a person, and we can understand the Son as a person, especially since Jesus himself came to us as a human being. But the Holy Spirit is a little bit different. Right here. We can see the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit in Scripture from the second verse in Genesis where the Spirit hovers over the face of the waters, to the closing book of the Revelation, where the Spirit and the bride say, come. But is the Spirit a person? Is he a distinct being? Yes. All through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, the personhood of the Holy Spirit is revealed. One problem that we may encounter is that the Holy Spirit is occasionally depicted is in impersonal terms, such as fire, water, or wind. Therefore, some argue that he must be some impersonal divine force, something like an electric current that empowers us, rather than a being who interacts with us in a personal, meaningful way. However, too many other texts refer to him in ways that make sense only if he, like the Father and the Son, is a divine person. Let's look at just a few of these texts. Romans 8, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And in Nehemiah 9, thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. First Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And in Luke 11, this is Jesus speaking, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Look at what the Holy Spirit does in these texts. 
speaks, he guides, he instructs, he loves, he teaches, he searches the heart, he intercedes for us, and he searches the deep things of God. Is he a person, yes or no? Some people believe that the Holy Spirit is just another form of Jesus, representation of himself that he sends to the earth after his ascension. That the Holy Spirit isn't a separate individual being co-equal with the Father and the Son, that he's just some nebulous manifestation of Jesus, some force or some energy. But is this true? Let's read John 16 again. We just read it a moment ago. But this time, let's read these verses as if when Jesus is speaking about the Comforter, He's really speaking about himself. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, then I will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send myself unto you. And when I am come, I will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Albeit, when I, the Spirit of truth, is come, I will guide you into all truth. For I shall not speak of myself, but whatsoever I shall hear, that shall I speak. And I will show you things to come. I shall glorify myself, for I shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, did any of that make any sense? Is Jesus bipolar here or schizophrenic? Is he legion? Is he many? Jesus is clearly speaking about the comforter as another being, individual and distinct from himself. The Apostle Paul also talked about the love of the Spirit. Doesn't love imply some sort of living being? Computers can't love. Impersonal forces or some kind of supernatural electricity cannot love. These texts make sense only if the Holy Spirit is a person not merely some unseen, unknowing, unknowable force. Look at John 15. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now let's read this text in the exact same way we just read John 16, replacing Jesus' name where the Comforter is, and let's see if it makes any more sense or less. But when I come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even myself, which proceedeth from the Father, I shall testify of me. Now, does that make sense? More sense or less sense? Is the Holy Spirit Jesus? No, he's a completely different being. Let's look at another text, Ephesians. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And chapter 4, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Who's doing the sealing here? The Holy Spirit. And in the book of Job, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. This here is a classic example of Hebrew idiom saying something and then saying the exact same thing using different words. You could just as easily reverse the two thoughts and write it this way. The breath of the Almighty hath made me, and the Spirit of God hath given me life. The Almighty and the Spirit are synonymous. They're interchangeable. At this point, I'd like to present you with some very clear passages from the Spirit of Prophecy. Perhaps you've heard these before, perhaps not, but let's look at these objectively. From evangelism, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And Christ triumphant, what gift could Christ bestow rich enough to signalize and grace his ascension to the mediatorial throne? It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty. Christ gave his representative, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. This gift could not be excelled. The Holy Spirit has a personality, else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person, 
else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these powers will work through us, making us workers together with God. The eternal heavenly dignitaries, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, arming them, the disciples, with more than mortal energy, would advance with them to the work and convince the world of sin. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifestly. The Word of God declares him to be the express image of his person. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father. The Comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Holy Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are how many? Three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these Notice this passage speaks about the Comforter being the Spirit. Some of you may recall that Spirit of Prophecy clearly states at one point that Jesus is the Comforter. So which is it? Is Jesus the Comforter or is Holy Spirit the Comforter? The answer is yes. Consider John 14, Jesus speaking here. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another Comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Another comforter clearly implies an original one, right? A first comforter. Who's the first comforter? Jesus. So Jesus is the first comforter. And when he returns to heaven, he prays to the Father to send another, a second comforter, the Holy Ghost, who is just like him. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So again, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. One last quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. By the spirit that the heart is made pure, through the spirit the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Look again at the baptism of Jesus in Luke 3. One God composed of three persons, all accounted. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a, like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, right after the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, we arrive at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, who but a member of the Godhead could lead a member of the Godhead anywhere? Right? Makes sense? Recall what P that Peter equated the Holy Ghost with God in Acts chapter 5. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost that was not lied unto men, but unto God? Is the Holy Spirit God? Is Peter deceived? Is his theology faulty? Listen to the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Notice the parallel here between the Son of Man and the Holy Ghost. 
both can be sinned against. But the difference is that speaking against the Holy Ghost is not forgivable. Think about that. One can speak against and blaspheme Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, the Redeemer of the world, and be forgiven. But if one speaks against some impersonal force or energy or essence, they will not be forgiven. Let's move to Hebrews. The author Paul asked, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? First Timothy tells us that God alone has immortality. So the eternal spirit would have to be God, right? If God alone is eternal and the Holy Spirit is eternal, then we can know that the Holy Spirit is God. There's so much more. First Corinthians, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Let's look at chapter 6. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Plainly, the temple of God is equated with the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? They're one and the same. The Holy Spirit is God. And don't forget what it says in 2 Peter chapter 1. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by who? The Holy Ghost. We know the truths we know only because the Holy Spirit, God himself, revealed these truths to holy men. And who better to reveal the secrets of God to man than God? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where we see not only the three members of the Godhead mentioned, but also the role of the Holy Spirit in the apostolic church. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by the self same by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these, sorry, worketh that one and that self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. No wonder David prayed in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The plan of redemption will be completed by all three members of the Godhead working together, each in various roles. God the Father sent Jesus the Son to redeem mankind, after which the Son sent the Holy Spirit to reproduce the life of character of Jesus in those who are being saved. Each member of the Godhead has their role, equal but different. One God, three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost together had one purpose in regard to fallen man, our salvation. All three persons of the Godhead were involved. That is why we can say with confidence the very words which Paul closed his second letter to the Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Finally, there are two last compelling bits of evidence for the truth of a Godhead composed of three divine, eternal, distinct living beings. The first bit of evidence we find in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Notice there are three unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Let's get prophetic and see if we can rightly inter interpret what this verse is telling us. The dragon, beast, and false prophet together constitutes Satan's unholy trinity. Just as there are three members in the divine Godhead, so there are three members in Satan's counterfeit. Satan has a counterfeit for every true thing of God. Isn't that right? Now we have to ask ourselves, why would Satan introduce a counterfeit of three in his unholy trinity? if there weren't three members of the Godhead. Who are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? We can't go into it in too much detail today, but the dragon 
Satan is the counterfeit of God the Father. He wants position and worship. The beast, the Roman Catholic papacy, is the counterfeit of God the Son. He wants to rule in your heart and mind. And the false prophet, sad to say, the United States of America, working through apostate Protestantism, is the counterfeit of God, the Holy Spirit. He wants to guide you away from all truth. This is Satan's unholy trinity, his counterfeit of the Godhead. Consider these other significant points which show Satan's counterfeit of God and his truth. Revelation speaks of the throne of God and also the throne of the beast. Jesus at Calvary received a mortal wound and was resurrected, just as the first beast of chapter 13, the papacy, receives a mortal wound and is healed. Christ's name Michael means who is like God, contrasting those who worship the beast and ask who is like the beast. Three times, three times the Father speaks from heaven. Number one, at Christ's baptism. Number one, at Christ's baptism. Number two, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And number three, during Jesus' prayer before his crucifixion. Three times, the first beast in Revelation 13, the papacy, opens its mouth to blaspheme God's name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Three times the last day faithful are described as those who keep the commandments of God. That slide's missing. Three times the fate of those who violate the commandments is stated. The second beast of chapter 13, the USA, is called the false prophet, a counterpart of the Holy Spirit, the avenue of true prophecy. In John 16, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth and into the worship of God. But the false prophet teaches lies and persuades people to worship the beast. Satan's trinity even pretends to create an image of the beast. Just as God created man in his own image, and Jesus was the express image of the Father. As God breathed into man the breath of life, a member of Satan's unholy trinity breathes life into the image of the beast. God sends three angels preaching the final message of the judgment hour leading members of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to believe the gospel and worship the God who created heaven and earth. Satan sends out three demons with messages from the mouth of the dragon, beast, and false prophet to assemble the nations for their great battle against the Lamb. God offers to stamp us with the seal of God. Satan offers the mark of the beast. God's remnant in the end time have Christ's testimony, they cling to their faith in Jesus, and they're privileged to sing on the sea of glass. Satan's remnant have chosen to believe his lies, realize too late that their faith in the dragon was worthless, and are consigned to the lake of fire. Satan wants worship. He wants to ascend into heaven. He wants to exalt his own throne above the stars of God. He wants to sit also upon the mount of the congregation at the sides of the north. He wants to ascend above the heights of the clouds. He wants to be like the Most High. And he wants to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In order to do that, he must counterfeit everything God does. If the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that Satan has a counterfeit three-member unholy trinity in the last days, doesn't it stand to reason that there must be a legitimate three-member Godhead for him to counterfeit? Otherwise, why would he do it? Why would he have a counterfeit of three if there were only an original two or one? The absolute final bit of evidence I'd like to leave you with today, that there is a divine Godhead formed of three distinct but equal beings, is in the form of a question we asked earlier. What is the minimum number of persons necessary in order to express perfect love? It goes without saying that in order to love, you must have at least two. Someone to love and someone else that is being loved. And then each continues loving the other and being loved in return. But is that the perfect revelation of love? 
Are those two beings expressing love to one another and receiving love again, is that the ultimate expression of perfect love? No. Love, godly love, agape love, the total and complete perfect revelation of what it is to love can only be fully and accurately realized to a minimum of two. Let me explain. God created the universe to be a triunity. What does that mean? It means that the universe has exactly three parts working in unison. What are the three elements of this triunity? Space, time, and matter. Space is composed of length, depth, and height, three and one. Take away one and you cease to have space. Time consists of past, present, and future, three and one. You move one, you no longer have time. Matter is composed of energy, motion, and phenomena, three in one. If there were no energy or motion, there would be no phenomena. In other words, nothing would happen. Isn't it interesting that the entire physical universe consists of three and only three aspects, space, time, and matter? If you were to take away any of these three, you would no longer have a universe. Uni meaning one, universe meaning altogether, whole, entire, combined in one. We see this triunity composing the very fabric of the universe. Now, why would the universe reflect a nature of three? Could it be that God made the universe to reflect his own nature? And just as this one universe exists as three, space, time, and matter, the one true God exists as three, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Scripture tells us in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. Not that he was love, or he one day became love, or that he one day will be love. No, he is love, always has, and always will be. And love cannot exist in a vacuum. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us that love is not self-seeking or selfish. It does not focus on itself. Love is relational. Love must be shared. The three members of the Godhead have always been in a perfect love relationship and always will be. To be in a love relationship is to communicate with one another, to freely give to one another, to live for one another. In short, to love is to be other-centered or to be more concerned for the happiness and well-being of another, not to be focused on oneself. Consider this passage from the Adventist poem. This was written to married couples who were childless. Selfishness, which manifests itself in a variety of ways, must die. If you had children and your mind were compelled to be called away from yourself to care for them, to instruct them, and to be an example to them, it would be an advantage to you. When two compose a family, as in your case, she's writing to a childless couple, and there are no children to call in to exercise patience, forbearance, and true love, there is need of constant watch watchfulness, lest selfishness obtain the supremacy, lest you yourselves become the center, and you require attention, care, and interest which you feel under no obligation to bestow upon others. Do you see how the full and perfect expression of love is complete only in a minimum of three? Perfect love cannot be expressed between two people only. There must be a minimum of three, or else there will be selfishness. There can be no true love. A husband and wife can love each other to the exclusion of anyone else, and that love can easily become selfish. I'm only interested and focused on them, giving love and receiving love from them. And they're only interested and focused on me, giving and receiving love from me. But when a third person comes into the family, say a child, now there can be a problem. Hold on. Things have changed. Because now our love much, must be shared equally. Lest one of us become jealous of the time the other two are spending together, because it means less love for me, because I'm no longer number one. 
Perfect love means that I'm not jealous or resentful of the relationship between the other two. On the contrary, I'm delighted by it. I'm thrilled for them that the relationship can grow and deepen and express itself more fully. And they're thrilled for me when I spend time alone with either one of them because our relationships can more fully develop and deepen. There is no jealousy, no resentment, only perfect love. Look at God's original intent in creating man. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What does it mean to be made after the likeness of God? means to reflect God's thinking and personality, to have a heart and mind capable of comprehending divine things. When we add in the directive to be fruitful and to multiply, to replenish the earth, to actually have a part in the creative process, we come to understand more fully that to be made in the likeness of God is to be a family. In Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me. Adam was incomplete without Eve. Without her, he didn't have another like him to relate to. We too are not functioning as whole persons unless we are in a relationship with others as God is. God made us to relate to one another as the Godhead relates to himself in three persons. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So now there was two. But God wasn't finished with creating mankind in his own image. Let's look at the next verse. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. These were the first words spoken to mankind recorded in Scripture. They're about what? Procreation. Making a family. For five days, God created and pronounced what he had created to be good. But on the sixth day, after creating man and woman and giving them the directive to multiply, to come together to create another life, only then did he declare things to be very good. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The triunity of the Godhead is the ultimate expression manifestation of love. Three beings expressing and receiving, three persons giving of themselves to each other and to us to bring about the plan of salvation, to ensure the redemption of mankind. Take away one of them, and you cease to have perfect love. The predominant issue in the great controversy is over the character of God, the character of love. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together reveal beyond the shadow of a doubt God is love. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. What does it mean to be a partaker of the divine nature? It means to exhibit in our lives the fruit of the Spirit, the transcript of God's character, the evidence of a life restored into the image of God. What does the fruit of the Spirit begin with? The fruit of the Spirit is love. God's nature and character of other-centered sacrificial love, rightly understood, is the most powerful argument in favor of the triunity of God. One day soon, the great controversy will end. Sin and sinners will be no more. The entire universe will be clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is one. I want to leave you with the last few excerpts from the Spirit of Prophecy. These are from very well-known and popular sources, the Acts of the Apostles. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. 
Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. To the repentant sinner hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you, Christ said. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. Spirit is given as a regenerating agency to make effectual the salvation wrought by the death of our Redeemer. The Spirit is constantly seeking to draw the attention of men to the great offering that was made on the cross of Calvary, to unfold to the world the love of God, and to open to the convicted soul the precious things of the Scripture. The desire of ages. Before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, Christ sought for the most essential and complete gift to bestow upon his followers, a gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of grace. I will pray the Father, he said, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will before this, the Spirit had been in the world. From the very beginning of the work of redemption, he had been moving upon men's hearts. But while Christ was on earth, the disciples had desired no other help. Not until they were deprived of his presence would they feel their need of the Spirit, and then he would come. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place person. Therefore, it was for their interest that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor on earth. No one could then have any advantage because of his vocation or his personal contact with Christ. By the Spirit, the Savior would be accessible to all. In this sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character on his church. Of the Spirit, Jesus said, He shall glorify me. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love. So the Spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character.